Once again, glad to see everybody here. Got uh, Eddie Willingham here with us tonight. Glad to see you. He's here with us and a bunch of home folk here tonight. So glad you're here. And uh, we'll go ahead and start off. Uh, Jennifer's not here, so I'm going to try my best to do singing. Now, if anyone wants, anyone wants to lead singing, please volunteer. The volunteers? Okay, all right. Well, uh, I'll do my best. You sing along with me. Sing loud. You won't hear me, okay? But what do we do? Let's sing a praise to God, all right? Let's lift up the Lord in, uh, in song tonight. And uh, we're going to turn over to Brother Rick here in a second, and we'll get rolling, okay? All right, 125. If you'll turn in your red book to 125, we'll love that stuff. Praise the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. Brother Rick? Got to be patient with me. I got to get wired up. I asked Brother Richard if I had to wire this thing. He said, yeah, because you won't be still. <laughs> and he's right, I won't. While I'm doing this, turn in your Bibles to Psalms 119. We've been preaching through Psalm 119 for a while. And uh, when I first started preaching through Psalms 119, I told you that the stanzas in Psalms 119 each stanza was one of the Hebrew alphabet. There's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And we're going to finish up Psalms 119 tonight. Try to bring you the message the Lord's laid on our heart. When you find Psalms 119, look at verse 169. When you find that, if you would, stand in honor of the reading of God's word. When we get through reading, I'm going to ask Brother Ken to lead us to the Lord in prayer. Then I'll try to give you what the Lord's laid on my heart. I hope it's a blessing. Psalms 119, starting in 169. Let my cry come near before thee. O Lord, give me understanding according to thy word. Let my supplication come before thee. Deliver me according to thy word. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteous. Let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee. Let thy judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant 
For I do not forget thy commandments. Brother Ken. Be seated. Uh, we're going to bring you a message tonight simply entitled this, Hear Me When I Call. If you look at Psalms 119, verse 169 through 176, those eight verses, one of the things that those eight verses have in common is each verse in some way or other refers to the Word of God. Each one of them does. And... Uh, to get us in context so we'll know exactly where the psalmist is at when he wrote this, in the section before this section, we had studied and, and looked at, and he had, he had come to a place in his life. Now, the whole Psalm 119 talks about him being under persecution, under trial, under tribulation, how his enemies are trying to cause him to falter and fail, how his enemies are trying to destroy him. And then when you get... To the section just before this last section, he had got to the place where he had got peace with himself and with God in his persecution, and he had surrendered everything to God. He surrendered the fact that he was going to be persecuted. He surrendered to the fact that he was going to have troubles. He surrendered to the fact that those things were going to happen. There wasn't nothing he could do about it. So he started focusing on God rather than on his trouble and his persecution. And he continues that thought in verse 169 through verse 176. But I want to show you what he does, and, and it's real interesting how he does this. In, in verse 169, he says, let me cry, or let my cry. The word cry there is a word that refers to the fact that he is earnestly pleading with God, but he tells us in that verse what he's asking for. Now, this is not the prayer of somebody that's in desperation. Okay, now, I think all of us understand praying in desperation. We've got to have an answer. We need it right now. Oh, I've got to know something, Lord. I need it. That's not this. He's not praying that way in this verse. He is pleading with God. He is pouring his heart out to God, but he's doing it. Here's the hard part about it, and you'll see it as we go through these verses. He's doing it very patiently, and he's asking God to do some things in these verses, but he asked, every time he asks God to do something, he asks God to do it based on God's Word. Now, before all of this, before it, the, the stanza before this, before he got to the place where he was trusting God and at peace with God, about everything. He was impatient. He was worried. He was troubled. He was, uh, he was like a troubled soul crying out, God, I got to have help it. I got to have it now. You don't see that in this portion of Scripture. You see somebody that is assured, that's still resting in peace with God, that's still trusting God, and his focus now is on God again and on God's Word. So look what he says. Let my cry... Come near before thee. Now, I think all of us, when we call on God, want to know God hears us. And we want an audience with God. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. He's calling out to God in an earnest need, but it's not an impatient need or an impatient desire. It's, it's not one of those situations. I, I think about kids a lot of times when, when, when I think about this because sometimes the kids will ask you for something, grandkids will ask you for something, and... Uh, their need to them is right now. I got to have it. Nothing else matters. Okay? Now, we can get that way with God sometimes. Psalmist is not like that right here. He, he is very patient in the way he prays, and you'll see that as we go through the verses. He's very patient. He is very trusting. He is at peace with God. He is at peace with the fact he's having trouble. He's at peace with the fact he's being persecuted, and he's not worried about it. Now you say, well, Brother Rick, does he like that he's being persecuted? No. Does he like that he's having trouble? No. But he realizes and he understands in the previous section, he understands 
that God is in control. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to say this, and, and I think y'all understand what I mean. All of us at one time or other have said, God is in control. It's biblical to say that. But do we really believe God is in control? Now, put it in context of this passage for a minute. If God is in control of all things at all times, and there's never a time when God is not in control, then regardless of what's going on in your life, God's in control. Brother Rick, my life's a mess right now. God's in control. So the psalmist is learning in these verses. I'm going to get way ahead of myself. I don't want to. But he's learning in these verses to do what all of us need to do when persecution comes, when trouble comes, when things come we don't understand. He is learning to be at peace, trusting God, realizing God's in control, and then asking God, okay, here's what's going on. Why is it going on? And, and it's not asking a question like he's questioning that God let it happen. He's wanting to know what, and I'm getting way ahead of myself, he's wanting to know what God's trying to show him through what's happening in his life. See, because God allows things in our life to teach us lessons. God allows things in our life to grow us. And if we don't understand what God is doing, we'll miss the lesson. Uh, a good example of this, when Jesus told the disciples to get in the ship and go across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, he just fed 5,000. And I think you'll remember, after he fed the 5,000, what did they take up? They took up 12 baskets of fragments. Brother Mick, each disciple had a basket of their own in the ship with them that told them, God takes care of me. God is able God sent them on the sea. They get in the storm, and the first thing they do is look at the storm, not at the basket. So they missed the message, and they missed the lesson God was trying to teach them. And what I'm trying to say tonight, and what the psalmist has learned here, is don't miss the message God's sending to you. Watch this. So he's, uh, he said, come, I want to come near before thee. He directs his petition to God. He's not asking for knowledge. Here's a real interesting thing. He said, let my cry come near before thy face, or near before thee. He wants an audience with God. Hey, listen, I'm going to tell you this. I'll share this with you. I think I've done it before. I, I keep track of stuff I pray for. And, and when I, Brother Nick, if I pray something and I get an answer, then that tells me at that point in place I have an audience with God, so it encourages me to pray more. Because I've now got his attention. And it's not that he's not listening. It's that I've finally gotten out of the way where he can hear me and do what I'm asking him to do. Or he changes me so I know what he wants. The psalmist is only asking for an audience before God. You know the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 that you and I are justified by faith in Christ Jesus and we also have access to God because of our faith in Christ. We can go to God anytime we want to. Any position, any time we can go to God. Watch what he says. He says, let my cry come near before thee. And then he says, oh, Lord, give me understanding. According, now here's what he bases it on. According to your word. He's saying, now the word understanding is real interesting. He didn't pray for knowledge. See, where we mess up sometimes is we pray for knowledge. Now, there's a big difference between knowledge and understanding. Knowledge is nothing more than an accumulation of facts. That's all it is. We used to play, before my mom passed away, I used to play Scrabble with her. And I'm going to tell you, you couldn't beat her in Scrabble. Sonia and I used to laugh. Becky, we used to laugh. Mama would come up with words and you'd go, there is no way that's a word. And she'd say, sure it is. Read your dictionary. And I finally asked her one day, I said, how in the world, Mama, can you remember all this? She said, well, when I'm sitting around, she's retired. When I'm sitting around, I ain't got nothing to do. I get the dictionary down, and I read the dictionary. And she read through the dictionary several times. And you couldn't beat her at Scrabble because she had 
understand or knowledge, but she also had understanding. She knew how to use it. Okay? Here's the difference between understanding and knowledge. Knowledge is an accumulation of facts. Understanding is the ability to comprehend those facts and relate them to situations in your life. You could call it discernment. One of the things that's missing in the heart and lives of believers today is good biblical discernment. So he's saying, Lord, I need you to give me understanding. I need you to help me look at this and not try to figure out why it's happening, but try to figure out what you're trying to teach me in this. So next time you have a hard day, next time you have a hard time, stop and ask God to show you what he's trying to teach you in the things that are taking place at that point and at that time. Listen, some of, the, some of the greatest lessons I've learned, I don't know how to say it any other way, I've learned through the hardest times in my life. And I learned them firsthand because I had to depend on God to get me through that situation. I had to depend on God to get me to the point I could even make it through that. And by doing that and listening to God, I saw what God was doing. And here's what it'll do for you. It's doing the same thing for the psalmist. I'll show you as we get to the end of this. The psalmist is getting to the point where he knows more and more and more about the workings of God in his life. Let me ask you this, and we're going to try to move on. He's seeking to understand the workings of God in his life, and it's almost as if he's saying, Show me what you want, God, but he's saying it according to your will. So the next time you get in a situation that you don't want to be in, all of us have been there, problems you don't want to face, then instead of saying, God, you're going to have to deliver me from this, then stop and say, God, what do you want to show me through this? What are you trying to teach me? Because God is trying to teach you and I things to grow us to be more Christ-like. The psalmist has progressed to the place where he wants to know God. He wants to know the will of God. But here's the kicker. He wants to know the will of God in his life regardless. That's a big word, Brother Mick. Lord, I want to know what you, you want in my life as long as it ain't got to be this. Lord, I want you to show me exactly what you want me to do in my life as long as I ain't got to go through this. See, it don't work like that. The psalmist has got to the place where he said, God, I want to know what you're doing in my life and what you're trying to show me in my life according to your word. So regardless of what happens, regardless of what your will is, I want to know it. The only way you can do that is be totally surrendered to God. Look at verse 170. So he said, let my cry in birth. That's a, a loud, earnest plead. In verse 170, he said, let my supplication. Well, that's a, he's entreating God. He's not asking for the persecution to stop. You'll never find in here where he says, Lord, let the persecution stop. I, I can't, I can't, you ever get to the point place when you laugh where you just say, God, I just don't know if I can take any more. I've been there. And almost instantly, when I said that, the verse come to my mind where it says, God has not, will not put anything on you above that you are able to bear, but will with the temptation give you a way to escape. God don't overlook. God knows what I can handle. God knows what you can handle. And God will push you to your limit so you'll grow so you'll grow. The question is, are we willing to grow? So he's not asking for the persecution to stop. He's not asking for God to get him out of the trial. Boy, I've done that before. God, I don't like this, God. Could you just get me out of this? You ever done that? When I first got saved, every time I'd get in trouble, Brother Mick, that's what I'd say. God, get me out of this. And he pulled me out of three or four things. And there was a day when I asked him that, and he spoke to my heart and said, if I pull you out of everything, you're never going to grow. You're never going to grow. And I began to realize 
that the things that are coming in my life, what about Job? You know, I can't find anywhere in the life of Job with all he suffered that Job ever said, God, just get me out of this. He was, he was not so much concerned about what he was going through. He was concerned about where God was at and what God was doing so he would know what God was doing. That's what we need to do. Watch this. He's asking God to deliver him. He does ask for that. But he's not asking to be delivered from his trials. He says, let my supplication, he's entreating God, come before you. Deliver me according to your word. Now we know that the written word contains the entire will of God. Right? So he is basically saying... God, I want you to deliver me, watch this, according to your will. There's the regardless. He's not saying, God, I'm tired of being persecuted. God, I'm tired of going through troubles. I, God, I just want a good day. You ever been there? Everything go wrong, say, God, I'd just like to have a good day. Can I tell you this? Regardless of how bad the day is, Every day is a good day trusting God. Every day is a good day trusting God. Let's go on. He has completely surrendered in this passage to the will of God for his life. He don't even know for sure what the will of God for his life is. But Brother Ken, he's completely surrendered to it. He don't know what it is, but he's saying, God, I want you to deliver me, but according to your word. So he's completely surrendered. Don't ask us a question. All of us a question. I'm going to move on. Are we completely surrendered to the will of God? He's surrendered to the working of God. See, sometimes God does things in our life that we don't like. Uh, I think it's obvious, but I'll go ahead and use it when they diagnosed me with prostate cancer. That was the last thing I wanted to hear. And if you'd asked me if I wanted to hear that, I'd have said, no, I do not want to hear that. But I'm just trusting God. And God is teaching me to trust him a little bit at a time. See, what I found out about myself is I'm impatient. I told you all that Sunday. I'm, or, yes, Sunday, I'm impatient. And, and God has to walk me into stuff because I want everything right now. And I'll pray about things, and sometimes God will say, okay, here's a little bit of an answer, but you've got to wait for the rest. You know what that makes you do? It makes you trust him. It makes you trust him. That's what the psalmist is doing. He's trusting. He's, he's surrendered to the will of God. He's surrendered to the working of God. Now he, see, he seeks deliverance according to the purpose of God contained in his word. Deliver me according to your word. He has peace and not just knowing, but understanding, I done said this, that God is in control. Now, I, I don't know what everybody's going through or have gone through. I look around and all of us have went through some hard stuff. But I think I can say this biblically. We, there may be places in our life that the stuff we went through, we would rather not have went through. I can give you a list. But here's the thing. As I look back on those things, I realize that God was in control in all of that. God carried me through all of that. I am a better person spiritually because of all of that. Because I just surrendered to the will of God. And a lot of times, there's some of that stuff, there's nothing you can do about it anyway. Nothing you can do about it anyway. It's going to happen. So why not trust God with it and seek God for the understanding of what God wants done in your life and then move on from there. So he said, hear my cry. He said, hear my supplication. So he, he has an earnest plea to God. He entreats God. Now look at verse 171. He says, listen to me. My lips shall utter praise. When thou hast taught me thy statutes. Now the word taught is real interesting. He's uh, asked God to hear his plea and give him understanding based on his word. He's asked God to hear his supplication and deliver him according to the will of his word. 
And now he's saying, my lips are going to praise you when you've taught me thy statutes. You know what the word taught means? Goat. It's like a cattle prod. Now, I know, Brother Mickey, you use cattle prod? Go, do you? Tell you a story. Now, I, I hate to tell these stories from my childhood because y'all going to think my daddy was mean. He wouldn't. When Ace Hardware first started up in, in Trine, Chan or Ace Hardware, Dad, <laughs> Dad and I went in there, and uh, Dad was a practical joker. I am. I, I'll play a joke on you in a heartbeat if I can get away with it. Dad was a practical joker, and we're walking down one of the aisles, true story, and I hear this, I thought, what is that? And I look around, Mick, and he's got an instrument about this long. And he's grinning. What is that? He's come here. I said, what is that, Daddy? And he, Brent, he hit me with that thing. And it was a cattle prod. And I screamed. So, and I look back, and Daddy's laughing. He knew it wouldn't hurt me. But I thought about that when I thought about this word. Because here's what the psalmist is saying. He said, I want to I wanna have understanding about your word, uh, about your will according to your word. I want to be delivered according to your word. And I'm going to praise you when you prod me with your word. When you're going through a trial, when you're going through persecution, when you're going through a time that you don't understand, if you'll stay with God and stay with the word of God, God will take the word of God and prod you the way you need to go. Now, sometimes getting prodded hurts. That's the whole point of the prod, to get you to do something you're not really wanting to do. The psalmist is saying, God, I'll praise you even when you prod me. So he's trusting God. Watch what he's saying here. He says, I'll utter praise, literally he's gushed forth in exalting God. He's moved from trouble and turbulent inside to openly exalting and praising God from a heart filled with joy and peace, knowing God's going to prod him when he don't go. You ever start going the wrong direction? And somebody leads you back over this way? When you and I try to go in the wrong direction, God will prod us through the Word of God. But here's the thing. we got to be reading and applying the Word of God and seeking the Word of God and God through the Word of God to get prodded in the right direction. He said, God taught him the Word literally is the goad. He became overwhelmed with praise and gratitude for God's working in his life. Again, please hear what I say. I, there's things that happened to me in my life that I wish had never happened. But when I look back on those things, I thank God for what he showed me through those times. Because I have a, a knowledge, a working knowledge of God that I did not have before that. I have a, a knowledge of God, an understanding, I should say, of God that I know he's there when I need him. When everybody else and the devil would say, where's he at? Where's that God at now? Well, he's there. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. You'll learn that. Look at verse 172. Verse 172. He said, loose my tongue. My tongue shall speak of thy word. There it is again. For all thy commandments are righteous. So now he's saying, okay, I want understanding according to your word. I, I want deliverance according to your word. I want to praise you as you prod me in the right direction. And now he talks about his tongue and what he says. And what I believe he's talking about here is the fact that he now is witnessing of the grace and the glory of God to others around him, even in his persecution. You know the best time, you know one of the best times to be a good witness is for somebody or for God? When you're going through one of the hardest times you've ever been through and you feel like you can't put one foot in front of the other and you just keep telling God, God, I cannot do it. I cannot go any further. And somehow God gets you through all that whether you realize it or not. There are people watching you that are saved and there are people watching you that are lost. And eventually, they'll probably come up and say, how in the world 
Did you get through that? If they're lost, it's a great opportunity to say, God got me through it. If they're saved, it's an even greater opportunity to say, look, this is what God will do for his children. So he's saying, God, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to, I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to witness about you. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, the latter part of that verse says it this way, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I'm looking at this verse, 72, 172, and I'm considering the psalmist, and I'm thinking, boy, he is so overjoyed and overwhelmed with the things of God in his life and the working of God in his life that he begins to speak to others about what God's doing in his life, and it is a witness and he don't even understand it as a witness. See, we go out every day and we think, well, I need to witness somebody. I need to witness somebody. Here's the thing. If we just let God live in us and through us and we just focus on God and focus our attention on being intimate with God, we'll be a witness. It'll flow out of us. Naturally. Naturally. Watch what he's saying. He said he'll proclaim the word. He'll proclaim the righteousness of the word. In Psalms 36, chapter, uh, verse 5, the Bible says, Thy mercy, O Lord, is in, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reaches under the clouds. Psalms 145, verse 17 says, The Lord is righteous. Watch this. Think about this. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, holy in all his works. You say, Brother Rick, I don't know about that because you don't know what I've been through. Well, let me ask you this. Take the things you've been through that hurt you so bad and look at it this way. When you were going through it, could you see the other end of it on the other side? No, you couldn't. You know who could? God. God. Because he's already there. He knows the beginning from the end. And he, did, he does in our life what is best for us, for our good and his glory. Verse 173, he said, let thy hand, look at it. Let thy hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. Here it is again. He said, I'm looking, I, I want you to help me, Lord. And it's not a desperation prayer. It is a prayer that he's saying, I want to know your will according to your word. I want to be delivered according to your word. I want to praise you according to your word as you prod me in the right direction. And then he's saying, my tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are righteous. And then in verse 173, he said, let thy hand help me for I've chosen your word. He says precept, but it's his word. You know what he's saying here? We're almost done. He's looking for the working of God in his life. Let me give you a challenge. I thought about this while I was studying this and and praying about this and looking at this, and I'll, I'll challenge you. When, when you go home tonight, when you pray in the morning, when, whenever you pray, make make this particular bullet a, a point in your prayer. Go before God and honestly ask God this, and you can say it in your own words. I just say it this way: God, I want to know what you're doing in my life but I want to know it to the point I see you working in my life I want to see God working in my let me let me ask you this can you see God working in your life man we can go around the room and, and I'm gonna tell you there's times again there's times I've, I've been through stuff that I didn't think God was working and, and brother Ken on this side of it I can look back and see where he was working. You know, and, and we gotta we gotta we gotta be sensitive to that. So when you pray, whenever you pray the next time, ask God to show you what he's doing in your life. God does not have a body like you and I have. So when he talks about I want to see your hand, it really what he's talking about is he wants to see God moving in his life. God doesn't have a hand like I've got and like you've got, but you can see the hand of God. In your life and on the life of others, if you'll just look. And he'll show it to you. Watch this. Learn to look for the hand of God in your life. Learn to look for the leading and the guiding of God in your life. 
Don't miss what he's doing in your life or what he's wanting to do in your life. Don't miss what he's wanting to do. What's this? He said, I've chosen the commandments of God. God's word revealed to us the plan, the purpose, and even the person of God that we serve. Through his word, we have an intimate relationship that grows daily as we seek God through his word and stay intimate with Christ. I, I've heard somebody say this, practice the presence of God. Listen, if you're saved, he lives in you and he's with you. And wherever you go, he goes. But we need to be acutely aware of the fact that he's there to the point we can sense him. Verse 174 and 175, he said, look at my longing. Look at my longing. I have longed for thy salvation. Again, it's deliverance, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee. Let my, thy judgments help me. So what he's saying here, longing is a very strong desire. He said, I have, I've had a desire to be delivered, but now he's saying, I've got a desire to be delivered, but according to your word. And now I'm delighting more in your word than in deliverance. Because when he's delighting in the word of God, he's delighting in the will of God and the working of God in his life. So he said, I'd rather have that than delivered. Watch this. He's saying he draws great joy from the Word of God. He trusts in the promises contained in the Word of God. He finds comfort in the promises of God's Word. There's a great comfort in the promises of God. Romans chapter 15, verse 4, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 15, verse 4 says, You and I have great promises. Let me read it. Look at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. I'm going to read that to you. I'll misquote it if I don't. He said there, for whatsoever things were written, afore were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We've got hope and promises through the word of God. And, and I'm not talking about a name it, claim it type thing. But if you and I seek God and we ask God to help us, and we ask God to give us understanding, and we do all these things, and we seek it through the Word of God and the Spirit of God, He'll do it, but He'll help us to apply the verses that we need to apply in our life, and it won't be just going through grabbing something and taking it out of context. It'll be fitting in our life. I remember one time at work, I was struggling to make a decision, and and uh, it's been years ago, I was... I was praying about some stuff, Brother Mick, and I was really struggling to figure out what God wanted me to do. And, and I was troubled. I can remember that. I was troubled as I was praying, trying to figure this thing out. And I started praying at work on my job, asking God, God, I just need, just give me a Bible verse. Give me something to teach me what you want me to do. I'll never forget it. This has been years ago. I've been at Roper 30, almost 34 years. This happened when I was at Regal, so it's been 35 to 40 years ago. Never forgot it. He laid a verse on my heart. All that came to my mind was Colossians 3.15. And I thought, so I read it, and I'm going to read the verse to you. Here's what it says. Let the peace of God rule in your heart to which you're called in one body and be you thankful. So I read that and I thought, that don't really give me an answer. So I went home, I got my dictionary out, and I looked up the word rule. You know what that word rule means in the original language? Umpire. Brother Mick, what's the umpire do at a ball game? Calls the shots, right? So can I paraphrase that verse? Let the peace of God call the shots in your life. And I learned from that verse at that time that God was telling me when I prayed about things and I felt like I got leadership, if I had peace about it, God probably was leading me in that direction. And I learned a valuable lesson. 
It stuck with me all these years. I didn't get it from a commentary. I didn't get it from somebody. Else. There's nothing wrong with any of that. God showed me that through his word, and it stuck. Now watch this, verse 176, and we're done. All right, he said, he said there at one place, Lord, hear my cry. Hear my cry. And give me understanding according to your word. In verse 170, he said, hear my supplication and deliver me according to your word. In verse 71, he said, my lips will praise you when you goad me in the right way. I'm getting what I asked for, right? My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteous. That's witnessing also. Then he said, let thy hand help me, for I've chosen your precepts. So right now he's focused on, here's what I want to do. I want God to, I want to see God in my life. I want to see the working of God in my life. I want to see what God wants me to do in my life. And he gets this big picture of God and what God's doing in his life. And all of a sudden, his vision changes in verse 176. And it changes to where God was leading him to start with. In the midst of all that, you know what he saw that we all need to see? When you get in the presence of God, when you really really get in the presence of God, you will see God as you've never saw him, but you will also see yourself as you really are. He got in the presence of God and the dealings of God in his life, and he looked around and he went, oh no, I have gone astray. I'm like a lost sheep. Seek me out, God, for I do not forget thy commandment. You know what he did? I, I, I'll use this as an example, and we're going to close. Uh, I think I may have told you all this. I had a, a water pipe bust under the house when I lived up on Ridge Street. And uh, when it actually it, it busted in the house, I run under the house to cut it off. Now, the houses in Ridge Street got that old steel pipe. And there was just enough room to run under the, under the house, well, just ducking a little bit. And I took off under the house, Brother Eddie. And I caught that steel pipe right here. And it gashed this eye open. I got a scar. You can look. You can see it. It's either this one or this one. It's so long I can't remember. But I went back in the house. I'd been crawling through the dirt. And I was sweaty. And I was nasty. And I thought I was sweating. It just kept, and I kept doing this and rubbing on my pants. I didn't even look. And it was blood. It was not sweat. It was blood. How long ago has it been? Walmart was down there where Marvin's is at. So I had to have some parts for the pipe so I jump in the car and I run to Walmart and I go in Walmart and I run to the bathroom and when I get to the bathroom wash my hands I look and I'm like oh lord did I come to Walmart looking like this I look pitiful but I would have never known that had I not seen myself in a mirror when you get close to God and you get God's will for your life does the Bible not say this is like looking in a mirror you see yourself as he sees you. And you know what we do? Oh, God, I'm sinful. God, I didn't realize that. I am so sorry. And that's what he did. He come before God, and he said, God, I am sorry. I'm just like a sheep that's went astray. Please seek me out, for I do not forget, and again, your word. Now, here's, here's the end of it. We're going to close. He said, I've lifted up my voice. My, my supplication came before you. My tongue has praised you. I've witnessed you, your hand on my life and the life of others. I've hungered for your word. In the midst of all that, I realize just how far I've strayed. And then he said, when we see God, we realize just how sinful and how needful we really are. That's why we need 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you seen God working in your life lately? Are you trying to see God working in your life? Let me ask you one more, one more thing. Brother Mick, get us a song. I challenge you when you prayed, I asked God to show you what he's doing in your life. I got another challenge for you. 
Ask God to let you see yourself. Not Listen, there's, every one of us got, got three opinions about herself, okay? We got what we think about ourselves. If I go around the room and ask, every one of us probably say, I'm a pretty good guy. Pretty good. You know? And we'd probably say that about each other. Yeah, pretty good. And then there's what everybody else thinks about us. And some people say, yeah, pretty good. And some people say, ah, he's jerk. Just depends on who it is. But both of those are prejudiced attitudes and prejudiced things. When you ask God, God, what I look like to you, and he shows you through this, you really get a picture of yourself. Let's stay in what page, brother? Page 